थीम टू राइटिंग एंड सिटी लाइफ सिटी लाइफ बिगैन इन मेसोपोटेमिया द नेम मेसोपोटेमिया इज डिराइव फ्रॉम द ग्रीक वर्ड मेसोस मीनिंग मेडल एंड पोटेमोस मीनिंग रिवर the land between the euphrates and the tigris river that is now part of the republic of iraq mesopotamian civilization is known for its prosperity city life its voluminous and rich literature and its mathematics and astronomy mesopotamia's writing system and literature spread to the eastern Mediterranean, Northern Syria, and Turkey after 2000 BCE, so that the kingdoms of that entire region were writing to one another, add to the Pharaoh of Egypt in the language and script of Mesopotamia. Here we shall explore the connection between city life and writing, and then look at some outcomes of a sustained tradition of writing. In the beginning of recorded history the land mainly the urbanized south see discussion below was called Samar and Akkad After 2000 BC when Babylon became an important city the term Babylonia was used for the southern region from about 1100 BCE when the Assyrian established the kingdom in the northern north the region became known as Assyria the first known language of the land was Sumerian it was gradually replaced by Akkadian around 2400 BC when Akkadian speakers arrived the language flourished till about Alexander's time 336 to 323 BC with some regional changes occurring from 1400 BC Aramic also trickled in this language similar to Hebrew became widely spoken after 1000 BC it is still spoken in parts of Iraq archaeologically in Mesopotamia began in the 1840s at one or two sites including Uruk and Mari which we discussed below excavation continued for decades no indian site has ever seen such long term projects not only can we study hundreds of mesopotamian buildings statues ornaments graves tools and seals as sources there are thousands of written documents mesopotamia was important to europeans because of references to it in the old testament the first part of the bible for instance the book of genesis of the old testament refers to shemer meaning sumer as a land of brick built cities travelers and scholars of europe looked on mesopotamia as a kind of ancestral land and when archaeological work began in the area there was an attempt to prove the literal truth of the old testament According to the Bible the flood was meant to destroy a life on earth however God chose a man Noah to ensure that life could continue after the flood Noah built a huge boat and ark he took a pair each of all known species of animals and birds on board the ark which survived the flood There was a strikingly similar story in the Mesopotamian tradition where the principal character was called Jusudra or Utnapishtim From the mid 19th century there was no stopping the enthusiasm for exploring the ancient past of Mesopotamia in 1873 a British newspaper found it an expedition of the british museum to search for a tablet narrating the story of the flood mentioned in the bible by the 19th century it was understood that the stories of the old testament were not literally true but may have been ways of expressing memories about important changes in history gradually archaeological techniques became far more sophisticated and refined 
what is more attention was directed to different questions including reconstructing the lives of ordinary people establishing the literal truth of biblical narratives recited into the backgrounds much of what to discuss subsequently in the chapter is based on this latter studies black sea turkey mediterranean sea aral sea caspian sea iran or indus persian gulf arabian sea desert of arabia red sea or nile egypt or tigris syria lebanon or euphrates mari babylon rook ewer map west asia activity 1 many societies have myth about floods these are often ways of preserving and expressing memories about important changes in the story find out more about this nothing how life before and after the flood is represented mesopotamia and its geography iraq is a land of diverse environment in the north is lie green and dulating plains gradually rising to tree covered mountain ranges with clear streams and wild flowers with enough rainfall to grow crops here agriculture began between 7000 to 6000 bc in the north there is a stretch of a plant called a steppe where animal herding offers people a better livelihood than agriculture after the winter rain sheep and goats feed on the grasses and low slabs that grow here to the east tributaries of the tigris provide routes of communication into the mountains of iran the south in is a desert and this is where the first cities and writing emerge say below this desert could support it is because the river euphrates and tigris uh, which rise in the northern mountains carry loads of slate fine mud when they flood or when their water is let out onto the fields fertile slate is deposited map to mesopotamia mountain steppe desert irrigated zone of south ard balik ard habur steppe assyria baghdad mari neneva nemrud assur ard tigris ard euphrates babylon tel ablesalabik uruk ur gulf desert zone of agricultural productivity irrigated southern limit of zone of rain fed agriculture and mountainous region after the euphrates has entered the desert it water flows out into a small channel this channel flowered their banks and in the past functioned as irrigation canals so water could be let into the fields of wheat barley peas or lentils when necessary of all ancient system that of the roman empire uh, them included it was the agricultural of southern mesopotamia that was the most productive even though the region did not have sufficient rainfall to grow crops not only agriculture mesopotamian sheep and goats that grazed on the steppe the north eastern plains and the mountain slopes that is on track to high for the rivers to flood and fertilize produced meat milk and wool in abundance further fish was available in rivers and dead pumps gave fruit in summer let us not however make the mistake of thinking that cities grew simply because of rural prosperity we shall discuss other factors by and by but first let us be clear about city life the earliest cities in mesopotamia date back to the bronze age 
3000 BC bronze is an alloy of copper and tin using bronze mean procuring these metals often from great distances metal tools were necessary for accurate carpentry drilling bears carving stone tools seals cutting sails for in light furniture etc mesopotamian weapons were also of bronze for example the tips of the spears that you see in the illustration on page the significance of urbanization urbanism cities and towns are not just places with large population it is when an economy develops in spheres other than food production that it becomes an advantage for people to cluster in towns urban economies comprise besides food production trade manufactures and services city people thus cease to be self sufficient and depend on the products or services of other city or village people there is continuous interaction among them for instance the carver of a stone seal require bone tool that he himself cannot make and colored stones for the seals that he does not know where to get his specializations is fine carving not trading the bronze tool maker does not himself go out to get the metals copper and tin besides he needs regular supplies of charcoal for fuel the divisions of labor is a mark of of urban life further there must be a social organization in place fuel metal various stones wood etc come from many different places for cities manufactures thus organized trade and storage is needed there are deliveries of grain and other food items from the village to the city and food supplies need to be stored and distributed besides many different activities have be have to be coordinated there must be not only stone but also bronze tools and pots available for seal cutters obviously in such a system some people give commands that other obey and urban economics uh, of fen requires the keeping of written records the worker head this omen heads was sculpted in white marble at uruk before 3000 bc the eyes and eyebrow would probably have taken lapis lazuli blue and self white and bitumen black in life respectively there is a groove along the top of the head perhaps for an ornament this is a world famous piece of sculpture admired for the delicate modeling of the woman's mouth chin and cheeks and it was modeled in a hard stone that would have been imported from a distance beginning with the procurement of stone list all the specialists who would be involved in the production of such a piece of sculpture activity 2 discuss whether the city life would have been possible without the use of metal a movement of goods into cities however reach the food resources of mesopotamia in mineral resources were few most parts of the south lack stones for tools seals and chests the wood of the iraqi date palm and popular was not good enough for carts cart wheels or boats and there was no metal for tools vessels or ornaments so we can surmise that the ancient mesopotamians could have traded their abundant textiles and agricultural produce for wood copper tin silver gold seal and various stones from turkey and iran or across the gulf this latter regions had mineral resources but much less scope for agriculture regular exchanges possibly only when there was a social organization to equip foreign expeditions and direct the exchanges were initiated by the people of southern mesopotamia Besides craft, trade, and services, efficient transport is also important for urban development. If it takes too much time or too much animal feed to carry grain or charcoal into cities on pack animals or block carts, the city economy will not be viable. 
the cheapest mode of transportation is everywhere over water river boats or barges loaded with sacks of grain are propelled by the current of the river and or wind but when animals transport goods that need to be fed the canals and natural channels of ancient mesopotamia were in fact routes of goods transport between large and small settlements and in the account on the city of mary later in the chapter the importance of the euphrates as a wild route will become clear Clay tablets, say 3200 BC, each tablet in 3.5 cm or less in height, with picture like signs, ox piece, grain, boat, and numbers. Ox, grain, fish, numbers, boat. The development of writing. All societies have languages in which certain spoken sounds convey certain meanings. This is verbal communication. Writing too is verbal communication, but in a different way. When we talk about writing or a script, we mean that spoken sounds are represented in visible key signs. The first Mesopotamian tablets written around 3200 BCE contain picture like signs and numbers. These were about 5000 lists of oxen, peas, bread, loaves. Etc. List of goods that were brought into or distributed from the temples of Uruk, a city in the south. Clearly, writing began when society needed to keep records of transactions because in city life transactions occurred at different times and involved many people and a variety of goods. Mesopotamians wrote on tablet of clay, a scribe would weight clay and pat it into size he could hold comfortably in one hand. He would a clay tablet written on both sides in cuneiform. It is a mathematical exercise. You can see a triangle and lines across the triangle on the top of the observed sides, you can see that the letter have been pressed into the clay. Cuneiform is derived from the Latin words cuneus meaning width and form meaning shape. Carefully smoothen its surfaces with the serpent of a rich curd obliquely. He would press a wish shaped cuneiform sign onto the smoothened surface while it was still moist. Once dried in the sun, the clay wood hardened in a tablet would be almost as indestructible as pottery. When a written record of say the delivery of pieces of metal had ceased to be relevant the tablet was thrown away once the surface dried signs could not be pressed onto a tablet so each transaction however minor required a separate written tablet this is why tablet occurs by 100 at mesopotamian site and it is because of this wealth of source that we know so much more about mesopotamia than we do about contemporary india by 2600 BCE or so, the letters became cuneiform and the language was Sumerian. Writing was now used not only for keeping records but also for making dictionaries, giving legal validity to land transfer, narrating the deeds of king and announcing the changes the king had made in the customary laws of, of the land. Sumerian, the earliest known language of Mesopotamia, was gradually replaced after 2400 BC by the Akkadian language. Cuneiform writing in the Akkadian language continued in use until the first century CE, that is, for more than 2000 years. The system of writing. The sound that a cuneiform sign represented was not a single consonant or vowel, such as M or A in the English alphabet, but syllables say put or la or in. Thus, the signs that a Mesopotamian scribe had 
to learn ran into hundreds and he had to be able to handle a wet tablet and get it written before it tried. So writing was a skilled craft but more important it was an enormous intellectual achievement. Conveying in visual form the system of sounds of the particular languages. Literacy. Very few Mesopotamians could read and write, not only were there hundreds of signs to learn, many of these were complex speech. If a kind king could read, he made sure that this was recorded in one of his boastful inscription. For the most part, however, writing reflected the mode of speaking. A letter from an official would have to be read out to the king. So it would be to my lord speak the say your servant be i have carried out the work assigned to me a long mythical poem about certain ends thus let these verses be held in remembrance and let the elder teach them let the wise one and the scholar discuss them let the father repeat them to his sons let the years of even the heart man to be open to them the uses of writing the connection between city life, trade, and writing is brought out in a long Sumerian epic poem about Enmarkar, one of the earliest rulers of Uruk. In Mesopotamian tradition, Uruk was the city par excellence, often known simply as the city. Enmarkar is associated with the organizations of the first trade of summer. In the early days, the epic says trade was not known, and Marker wanted lapis lazuli and precious metal for the beautification of a city temple and sent his messenger out to get them from the chief of a very distant land called Aratta. The messenger headed the word of the king. By night, he went away just by the stars. By day, he would go by heaven, sun divine. He had to go up into the mountain ranges and had to come down out of the mountain ranges. The people of Susa, a city below the mountains, saluted him like tiny mice. Five mountain ranges, six mountain ranges, seven mountain ranges he crossed. The poet means the ones that messenger had climbed to a great height. Everything appeared small in the valley for below. The messenger could not get the chief of Aratta to part with a lapis lazuli or silver, and he had to make the long journey back and forth again and again, carrying threats and promises from the king of Uruk. Ultimately, the messenger grew wary of mouth. He got all the messages mixed up. Then Enmarkar formed a clay tablet in his hand, and he wrote the words down. In those days, there had been no writing down of words on clay. Cuneiform letters were whisked hence like nails. Given, written, given the written tablet, the ruler of Aratta examined the clay. The spoken words were nails. His face was frowning. He kept looking at the tablet. This should not be taken as the literal truth, but it can be inferred that in Mesopotamian understanding, it was kingship that organized trade and writing. This poem also tells us that besides being a mean of storing information and of sending messages apart, writing was seen as a sign of the superiority of Mesopotamian urban culture. Urbanizations in Southern Mesopotamia, Temples and Kings From 5000 BCE, settlements had begun to develop in Southern Mesopotamia. The earliest cities emerged from some of these settlements. These were of various kinds, those that gradually developed around temples, those that developed as center of trade and imperial cities. It is cities of the first two kinds that will be discussed here. Early settlers, their origins are unknown, began to build and rebuild temples at selected spots in their village. The earliest known temples was a small shrine made of unbacked bricks. Temples were the residence of various gods, of the moon god of Ewer or of Inanna, of goddess of love, and were constructed in bricks. Temples became larger over time. 
with several rooms around open courtyards above the early ones were possibly not unlike the ordinary house for the temple was the house of a god but temples always had their outer walls going in and out at regular intervals which no ordinary building ever had the earliest known temples of the south see 5000 bc plan altar oven entrance the god was the focus of worship to him or her people brought grain curd and fish the floors of some early temples had thick layers of fish bone the god was also the theoretical owner of the agricultural field the fisheries and the herds of the local community in time the processing of produce for example oil pressing grain grinding spinning and the weaving of woolen clothes was also done in the temple organizers of production at a level above the houses employers of merchants and keeping keeper of written records of distribution and allotments of grains plow animals breed bear fish etc the temple gradually developed its activity and became the main urban institution but there was also another factor on the scene in spite of natural fertility agriculture was subject to hazard the natural outlet channel of the euphrates would have too much water one year and plowed the crops and sometimes they would change course to altogether as the archaeological record shows villagers were periodically relocated in mesopotamian history there were man made problems as well those who lived on the upstream a temple of a later period 3000 bce with an open courtyard and in and out facet as excavated the stretches of a channel could divert so much water into their fields that villages downstream were left without water or they could neglect to clean out the slate silt from their stretch of the channel blocking the flow of water further down so the early mesopotamian countryside saw repeated conflict over land and water when there was continuous warfare in a region those chiefs who had been successful in war could oblige their followers by distributing the loot and could take prisoners from the defeated groups to employ as their guards or servants so they could increase their influences and clubs such war leaders however would be here today and gone tomorrow until a time came when such leadership came to increase the well-being of community with the creation of new institution or practices in time victorious chiefs began to offer precious booty to the gods and thus beautifully the community's temple they would send men out to fetch fine stones and metal for the benefit of the god and men out to fetch fine stones and metal for the benefit of the god and community and organized the distribution of temple wealth in an efficient way by accounting they would send men out of fish fine stone and metal for the specific of god and community organize the distribution temple wealth in an efficient way by accounting for things that came in and went out as the poem about and marker shows the gave the king high status and the authority to command the community we can imagine a mutually reinforcing cycle of development in which leaders encourage the settlement of villages close to themselves to be able to repeatedly get an army together besides people who would be safe living in close proximity to one another at uruk one of the earliest temple towns we found depiction 
of armed heroes and their victims and careful archaeological survey have shown that around 2000 BC when work grew to the enormous extent of 2050 hectares twice as large as Mohenjo-daro would be in later centuries. Dozen of small villages were deserted. There had been a major population shift significantly. Rook also came to have a defensive wall at a very early date. The site was continuously occupied from about 4200 BC to about 400 C, and by about 2800 BC, it had expanded to 400 hectares where captives and local people were put to work for the temple or directly for the ruler. This rather than agricultural tax was compulsory. Those who were put to work were paid rations. Hundreds of rations left have been found which give against people's names. The quantities grain, cloth or wild allotment to them, it has been estimated that one of the temples took 1,500 men working 10 hours a day, 5 years to build, with rulers commanding people to fetch stones or metal ores to come and make bricks or lay the bricks for a temple, or else to go to a distance county. To fetch suitable materials, there were also technical advances at Uruk around 3000 BCE. Bronze tools came into use for various craft. Architects learned to construct brick columns, there being no suitable wood to bear the weight of the roof of large hull. Hundreds of people were put to work at making and baking clay cones that could be pushed into temple walls, painted in different colors, creating a colorful mosaic in sculpture. There were superb achievements, not in easily available clay, but in imported stone, and then there was a technological landmark that we can say in appropriate to an urban economic. The potter's wheel, in the long run, the wheel enables a potter's workshop to mass produce dozens. Top basalt steely, showing a bearded man twice, nods his headband and hairs, waistband and long skirt. In the lower scene, he attacks a lion with a huge bow and arrow. In the scene above, the hero finally kills the rampant lion with a spear. 3000 200 BC. Still is a stone slabs with inscription or carving. Impression of a cylinder seal. See 3200 BC. The bearded and armed standing figure is similar in dresses and hairstyle to the hero in the stele shown above. Note three prisoners of wear their arms bound and a fourth man uh, beast. Be beseeching the world leader. The seal, an urban artifact. In India, early stone seals were stamped in Mesopotamia until the end of the first millennium BC. Cylindrical stone seals pierced down the center were fitted with a stick and rolled over wet clay so that a continuous pictures was created. They were carved by very skilled craftsmen and sometimes carry 
writing. The name of the owner, his guard, his official position, etc. A seal could be rolled on clay covering the string knot of a cloth package or the mouth of a pot. Keeping the content shapes when rolled on a letter written on a clay wallet, clay tablet, it became a mark of authenticity. So the seal was the mark of a city dweller's role in public life. Five early cylinder seals and their impressions describe what you see in each of the impressions. Is the cuneiform script shown on them? Life in the city. What we have seen is that a ruling elite had emerged, a small section of society had a major share of the wealth. Nothing makes this fact as clear as the enormous riches, jewelry, gold, vessels, wood, and musical instruments inlaid with white cells and lapis lazuli, ceremonial daggers of gold, etc., buried with some kings and queens at you. But what of the ordinary people? We know from the legal text disputes, inheritance methods, matters, etc., that in Mesopotamian society the nuclear family was the norm. Although married son and his family often resided with his parents, the father was the head of the family. We know a little about the procedures for marriage. A de declaration was made about the willingness to marry. The bride's parent uh, giving their consent to the marriage. Then a gift was given by the groom's people to the bride's. A nuclear family comprises of man, his wife, and children. People, when uh, the wedding took place, gifts were exchanged by both parties who ate together and made offering in the temple. When her mother-in-law came to fetch her, the bride was given her share of the inheritance by her father. The father's house, hearts, fields, etc. were inherited by the sons. Let us look at Ewer, one of the earliest cities to have been excavated. Ewer was a town whose ordinary houses were systematically excavated in the 1930s. Narrow winding streets indicate that wheel cards could not have reached many of the houses. Sacks of grain and firewood would have arrived on donkey back. Narrow winding streets and the irregular shapes of house floors also indicate an absence of town planning. There are no street drains of the kind we found in contemporary Mohenjo-daro drains and clay pipes were instead found in the inner courtiers of the ewer houses and it is thought that the house roof sloped inward and rainwater was channeled by the drain pipes into sumps in the inner courtiers. A sump is a covered basin in the ground into which water and sewage flow. This would have been a way of preventing the unpaved street from becoming excessively slashy after a downpour. A residential areas at Ewer, see 2000 BC, can you locate besides the winding streets two or three blind alley? Yet people seem to have swept all their household refuse into the streets to be trodden underfoot. This made streets level rise and over time the three sorts of households had also to be raised to that no mud would flow inside after the rains. Light came into the rooms not from windows but from doorways opening into the courtiers. This would also have given families their privacy. There were superstitions about houses recorded in omen uh, tablets at Ewer. A raised threshold brought wealth. A front door that did not open towards another house was lucky. But if the main wooden door of a house opened outwards instead of inwards, the wife would be a torment to her husband. There was a town cemetery as you are, in which 
the graves of royalty and commoners have been found, but a few individuals were found buried under the floors of ordinary houses. A trading town in a pastoral zone. The location of Mari. River Euphrates, agricultural land, Mari. Low lying flooded land, Plateau. Land flooded each year, late spring glaciers posture. Agricultural land, terrace, the canal water cannot reach pasture land. Pasture land in spring. Seasonal system Wadi low lying land to plateau. After 2000 BCE, the royal capital of Mari flourished. You will have noticed the map that Mari stands not on the southern plain with its highly productive agriculture but much further upstream on the Euphrates map 3 with its color coding shows that. Agriculture and animal rearing were carried out close to each other in this region. Some communities in the kingdom of Mary and both farmers and pastoralists, but, but most of its territory was used for pasturing sheep and goats. Herders need to exchange young animals, cheese, leather and meat in return for grain, metal tools, etc. and the manure of a pint Block is also of great use to a farmer, yet at the same time there may be conflict. A shepherd may take his flocks to water across a shown field. To the ruin of the cob herdsman being mobile can raid agricultural village and face their stored goods. For their birds, settled groups may deny pastoralist access to river and canal water along to along a certain set of parts. Through Mesopotamian history, nomadic communities of the, of the western desert filtered into the prosperous agricultural heartland. Support would bring their flocks into the shown area in the summer. Such groups would come in as herders. Harvest laborers or hired soldiers occasionally become prosperous and settle down. A few gained the power gained the power to establish their own rule. This included the Akkadians, Amortis, Assyrians, and Aramaeans. You will read more about rulers from pastoral societies. In the five, we king of Mari were Amorites whose dress differed from that of the original inhabitants and who respected not only the gods of Mesopotamia but also raised a temple at Mari for the gun, god of the steppe, Mesopotamian society and culture were thus open to different people and culture and the vitality often of the civilizations were perhaps due to the to this intermixture. A warrior holder a long spear and a weaker shield note the dress typical of a amortis and different from that of the Sumerian warrior shown on page 38. These pictures were incised on cell since 2600 BC. The palace at Mari of King Jimrilim, 1810-1760 BC. Audience Hall 132, 
outer code 131, inner code 106 and transcate well. Courtyard 131 scribes office with benches and clay bins for storing tablet. The palace at Mari of King Jimrilim, 1810 to 1760 BC. The great place of Mari was the residence of the royal family, the hub of administration and a place of production, especially of precious metal ornaments. It was so famous in its time. Then a minor king came from North Syria just to see it, carrying with him a letter of introduction from a royal friend of the king of Mary, Jim Rim. Dali, lest reveal that huge quantities of food. Daily list reveal the huge quantities of food were presented each day for the king's table, flour, bread, meat, peas, fruit, beer and wine. He probably ate in, in the company of many others in or around country at 106. Pepped white You will notice from the plan that the places had only one entrance. On the north, the large open country yards such as 131s were beautifully popped. The king would have received foreign dignities and his own people. In 132, a room which, with wall painting, not wood. The king would have received foreign uh, dignities and his own people in 132, a room with a wall painting that would have owed the visitor. The palace was a sprawling structure with 260 rooms and covered an area of 2.4 hectares. Kitchen, workshop and kitchen, royal suite laboratory and bath painting on wall of 132 activity 3 trace the route from the entrance to the inner court what do you think would have been kept in the storerooms How has the kitchen been identified? Comment this. The kings of Mari Harbor had to be vigilant. Harder of various tribes were allowed to move in the kingdom, but they were was the camps of herders are mentioned frequently in letter between kings and officials. In one letter, an officer writes to the king that he has been seeing frequent fire signals at night sent by one camp to another and he suspects that a raid or an attack is being planned. Located on the Euphrates in prime position for trade, in Urs 
copper, tin, oil, wine, and various other goods that were carried in boats along the Euphrates between the south and the mineral riches. A plants of Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. Mary is a good example of an urban center prospering on trade boats carrying grinding stones, wood, and wine, and oil jars would stop at Mary on their way to the southern cities. Officers of this town would go aboard, inspect the cargo, a single river boat could hold 300 wine jars and levy a charge of about one-tenth the value of the goods before allowing the boat to continue downstream. Barely came in special gain boats. Most important tablets refers to copper from Alasia. The Iceland of Cyprus, known for its copper and tin, was now also an item of trade as bronze was the main industrial material for tools and weapons. This trade was of great importance thus although the kingdoms of Mary was not militarily strong, it was expeditionally prosperous. Excavating Mesopotamian towns Today, Mesopotamian excavators have much higher standards of accuracy and care in recording than in the old days, so that few dig huge areas the way you are was excavated. Moreover, few archaeologists have the fund to employ large teams of excavators, thus the modes of obtaining data was changed. Take the small town at Abu Slavic, about 10 hectares in area in 2500 BC, with a population less than 10,000, the outlines of walls were at first traced by scrapping surfaces. This involves scrapping of the top few millimeters of the mound with the sharp and white and of a shovel or other tools. While the soil underneath was still slightly moist, the archaeologists could make out different colors, textures, and lines of uh, bricks, wall, or pits, or other features. If houses that was, were discovered and excavated, the archaeologists also sifted through tons of earth to recover plant and animals remain and in the process identifying. I identified uh, many species of plants and animals and found large quantities of charred fish bones that had been sipped out onto the streets. Plant seeds and fiber remained after dung cakes had been burned as well and thus kitchen were identified. Living rooms were those with fewer traces because they found the teeth of very young pigs on the street. Archaeologists concluded that pigs must be roamed freely. Huge hair, freely hair, as in any other Mesopotamian town. In fact, one has burial contained some pig bones. The dead person must have been given some pork for his nourishment. In the in the artifact, the archaeological the archaeologist also made microscopic studies of room floors to decide which rooms in a house were roofed with popular locks, locks, palm leaves, straws, etc. And which were open to sky. Cities in Mesopotamian culture. Mesopotamian valued city life in which people of many communities and cultures lived side by side after cities were destroyed in war. They recalled them in poetry. The most poignant reminder to us of pride Mesopotamians took in their cities come at the end of the Gilgamesh epic, which to us written on 12 tablets Gilgamesh is said to have ruled the City of Uruk, 
some time after and marker a great hero who subdued people far and wide he got a shock when his heroic friend died he then set out to find the secret of immortality crossing the waters that surround the world after a heroic attempt glemais failed and returned to ark there he consoled himself by walking along the city wall back and forth he admired the foundation made of fired bricks that he had put into place it is on the city wall of uruk that the long tale of heroism and endeavor fizzles out gilgamesh does not say that even though he will die his son will outlive him as a tribal hero would have done he takes consolation in the city that his people had built the legacy of writing while moving narratives can be transmitted orally science requires written texts that generations of scholars can read and build upon perhaps the greatest legacy of mesopotamia to the world is its scholarly tradition of time reckoning and mathematics dating around 1800 bc our tablets with multiplication and division tablets table squares and square root tables and tables of compound integers the square root of 2 was given as 1 plus 24 by 60 plus 51 by 60 whole square plus 1 10 by 60 cube if you work this out you will find that the answer is 1.4142296 only slightly different from the correct answer 1.4142356 students had to solve problems such as the following a field of area such and such is covered one finger Deep in water, find out the volume of water. The division of the year into twelve months according to the revolution of the moon around the earth. The division of the month into four weeks, the day into twenty-four hours, and the hours in the sixty minutes. All that we take for granted in our daily lives has comes. has come to us from the mesopotamians these time divisions were adopted by the successors of alexander and from there transmitted to the roman world then to the world of islam and then to medieval europe the system 7 for how this happened whenever solar and lunar eclipses were observed their occurrence was noted according to year month and day so too there was records about the observed positions of stars and constellations in the right night sky none of these momentous mesopotamian achievements would have been possible without writing and the urban institution of school where students read and copied earlier written tablet and where some boys were trained to become not record keepers for the administration but intellectuals who could build on the work of their predecessors we would be mistaken if we think that the pre occupations with the urban world of mesopotamia is a modern phenomenon let us look finally at two early attempt to locate and preserve the text and traditions of the past an early library in the iron age the assyrian of the north created an empire of its height between 720 and 610 bc that stretch as far west west as egypt the state economy was now a predatory one exact extracting labors and tribute in the form of 
foods, animals, and metal crafting items from a vast subject population. The great Assyrian kings who had been immigrants acknowledged the southern region Babylonia as the center of high culture and the last of them Assur by Nepal 668-627 BC collected a library at his capital Nineveh in the north. He made great efforts to gather tablets on history, epics, omen, literature, astrology, hymens, hymns and uh, poems. He sent his scribes south to find old tablets because scribes in the south were trained to read and write in schools. Where they all had to copy tablets by the dozen, there were town, towns in Babylonia where which collection of tablets were created and acquired fame. And although Sumerian ceased to be spoken after about 1800 BC, it continued to be taught in school through. Through vocabulary text, sign list, bilingual, Sumerian, and Akkadian tablets each. So even in 650 BC, cuneiform tablets written as far back as uh, 2000 BC were intelligible. And Asurba Nepal's men know, knew where to look for early tablets for their copies. Copies were made of important texts such as the Epic of Gligames, the copiers stating his name and writing his done writing the date uh, some tablets ended with a reference to Asur Asurbanipal I Asurbanipal king of the universe king of Assyria on whom the gods uh, bestowed vast intelligence who could acquire the recondite details of scholarly erudition I wrote down on tablet the wisdom of gods and I checked and collected the tablets. I placed them for the future in the era, future in the library on the temple of my god Nabu at Nabu at Nineveh for my life and the well being of my soul and to sustain the foundations of my royal throne. Most important. There was a cataloging, a basket of tablet would have a clay level that writ. That was cataloging, a basket of table would have a clay level that read n numbers of tablets about Exorcisms written by X Ashurbanipal's library had a total of some 1,000 texts amounting to about 30,000 tablets grouped according to subject. And an early archaeologist, a man of the southern Marses, Nobo Palace Sirs released Babylonia from Assyrian domination in 625 BC. His successor increased their territory and organized building project at Babylon. From the, the time even after the Achaemenids of Iran conquered Babylon in 539 BC and until 331 BC when Alexander conquered Babylon. Babylon was the premier city of the world, more than 850 hectares with a triple walls, great palace and temples, a ziggurat or step tower and a processional way to the ritual center. Its trading house had widespread dealing and its mathematicians and astronomers made some new discoveries. Nabonidus was the last ruler of the independent Babylon. He 
writes that the God of Ewar came to him in a dream and ordered him to appoint a priestess to take charge of the cult in that ancient town in the deep south. He writes because for a very long time the office of high uh, priestess had been forgotten, her characteristic features now were indicated. I bethought myself day after day. Then he say he found the steel of a very early king whom we today date to about 1150 BC and saw on that steel the carved image of the priest's place. He observed the clothing and the jewelry that was depicted. This is how he was able to dress his daughter for her cons consecrations as priestess. On another occasion, uh, Nabonidus's men brought to him a broken statue inscribed with the name of Sarjon, king of Akkad. We know today that the latter ruled around 2370 BC. Nabonidus and indeed many intellectuals had heard of this great king of remote times. Nabonidus felt he had to repair the statue. Because of my reverence for the gods and respect for kingship, he writes, I summoned skilled craftsmen and replaced the head. Activity 4. Why do you think? Ashurbanipal and Nabonidus cherished early Mesopotamian traditions. Comment this. Timeline C. 7000 to 6000 BC, beginning of agriculture in the northern Mesopotamian plains. 5000 BC, earliest temples in southern Mesopotamia built. 3200 BC, first writing in Mesopotamia. 3000 BC, rock develops into a huge city, increasing use of bronze tools. 2700 to 2500 BC, early kings, including possibly the legendary ruler Gligamesh. 2600 BC, development of cuneiform script. 2400 script, replacement of Sumerian by Akkaran. 2370, Sargon, king of Akkad. 2000 BC, spread of cuneiform writing to Syria, Turkey, Egypt. Mary and Babylon emerge as important urban center. 1800 BC, mathematical text composed Sumerian no longer spoken. 1100 BC, establishment of Assyrian kingdom. 1000 BC, use of iron. 722 6 10 BC, Assyrian Empire, 668 to 627 BC, rule of Assurbanipal, 3, 331 BC, Alexander conquers Babylon, see first century C, Akkadian and cuneiform remain in use, 1850s. Deciferment of cuneiform script. Exercises answer in brief. Answer in a short essay. Comment this.